So the last video that I dropped was reacting to the Daniel House trade, talking about how it set the stage for some more moves for the Sixers, and why I was so excited about the potential of what this could become. Well, more moves did occur, and my excitement is out the window. In this video, I want to break down the Jaden Springer and Patrick Beverly trades, talk a little bit about the, the future of the Sixers, the outlook that they took at the trade deadline, and why I'm really just so straight up frustrated with the decision making right now. So let's dive right into it and start by breaking down move my boof. We'll begin with the Pat Bev trade and, and also just give a shout out to Pat Bev for breaking the news on his own podcast, him tweeting out the breaking Pat Bev to the Milwaukee Bucks. That ultimately was proven true. There were reports coming out from Shams and Woj pretty soon after the fact. Ultimately, the Sixers netting a second round pick and campaign you can make the, the case that campaign is a better shooter than pat bev statistically he certainly is i'm not quite as much of a fan of his game frankly i've grown very fond of having patrick beverly on this team i think he stepped up every time the team needed him to when they were shorthanded i know he's not the perfect piece and i get the frustrations with him he's not again he's not the perfect player he has his limitations but for what he is he's exactly what this team needed that he was pj tucker with a little more substance to him that little hook shot, I love seeing. He can still defend at a high level. There was more juice left in his legs than I expected at this point in his career. And I really like just having him on the Sixers team, both on and off the court. I thought he was a great fit with Philadelphia. So definitely frustrating to see that. And to make matters worse, the next move coming from Woj himself, the 76ers are trading Jaden Springer to the Celtics for a second round pick. Now, this is where the true frustration brings in. Because the Sixers now traded their top two perimeter defenders in Patrick Beverly and Jaden Springer. And by the way, perimeter defense already an area that I would say was a weakness of their Sixers team. But they traded their top two perimeter defenders to the top two contenders in the Eastern Conference in the Milwaukee Bucks and Boston Celtics. So I don't understand the logic there. And my biggest frustration as a whole is the Sixers refuse to pick a direction here. Is this morning the first trade that we have a breakdown on the Buddy Heald trade I was thrilled with, that I love having Buddy Heald on this team, and that was a win-now move. That was trading three second-round picks for Con Korkmaz and Marcus Morris to bring in Buddy Heald, who can elevate this offense and does check both boxes of helping the team stay afloat while Joel Embiid is out, and being a win-now piece when he does return. I love the idea of having shooters around Joel Embiid. I love what, what we've seen in past years with guys like Seth Curry and J.J. Redick. That is what Buddy Heald brings to this team. But to then turn around and then basically sell guys off with Jaden Springer, with Patrick Beverly, to kick the can down the curb to prioritize bringing in draft picks, it's very frustrating. And they are striking that middle ground. That if you're looking to contend this year, it doesn't make any sense to trade away Patrick Beverly. But if you are looking to rebuild and collect for next year, it doesn't make any sense to trade three first-round picks for Buddy Heald. So I don't like the lack of direction from the Sixers team. I hate that they're kind of caught in this no-man's land and very frustrating as a whole from Daryl Morey. And to lay things out as a whole, the moves now that the day is complete, the Sixers acquired Buddy Heald, Cameron Payne, and two second-round picks, and they sent out Marcus Morris, Furkan Korkmaz, Patrick Beverly, Jaden Springer, Daniel House, and four second-round picks. I am going to go a little more in-depth in Springer specifically because I think he's a noteworthy part of this. But first, let's take a look at the Sixers roster as a whole. Point guard, we got Tyrese Maxey, Cameron Payne, and Terquavion Smith. Shooting guard, De'Anthony Melton, Buddy Heald, and Ricky Council the fourth. I do think Buddy will ultimately be the starter in that situation, but just listed him out here. Small forward, Tobias Harris, Kelly Oubre, and K.J. Martin, who I am shocked that K.J. Martin survived this trade deadline. Power forward, Nico Batum and Robert Covington. Although Covington does not look like he's returning the floor anytime soon, those knee injuries seem pretty significant there. And then at center, Joel Embiid, Paul Reed, and Mo Bamba. And that, what, what that means is that there are three remaining spots for buyout guys there. Now, I will drop another video talking more in depth about the buyout candidates. There are some names floating out there, the Kyle Lowry's of the world, who hasn't officially been bought out yet. Guys like Robin Lopez, Marcus Morris, who's ineligible to come back because he was just traded. Furkan also hit the buyout market. But there are a lot of names out there. Joe Harris is a guy at the top of my list. Spencer Dinwiddie. There are guys that I'm going to get into and discuss on here, but that will be for another video. And also, the bottom line is, as great as these names may seem, you don't win championships through the buyout market. And you also don't win championships by just giving away straight up talent the way that they did with Jaden Springer. Now, Jaden Springer is not a perfect player. Jaden Springer is not even a guy that I would consider one of my guys out there on the court. If you want to point to it at Terquavion Smith, I'll be all over him, gassing him up night in and night out. That is a one of my guys. Jaden Springer is not that, but I still don't understand the logic in trading him away for this. For just the cost of a second round pick, it makes zero sense to go up on a guy who's 21 years old, who has shown linear progress, 
and right now is an NBA game-changing defender. That we're coming off a night that, yes, I know they got blown out in the end of this game, but Jaden Springer guarded Steph Curry, held him to 0 for 4 shooting in 9 minutes, 0 points, 0 assists, and 0 rebounds. That was the first time that Steph Curry was held scoreless in a quarter since 2014. That was Jaden Springer as the primary defender. So shout out to Springer for that, and he is going to help the Celtics. I don't know in the short term if he's going to be a, an immediate impact to that team. But I do think when we look back on Jaden Springer, when we look back at his career, he's going to be a very nice high-level rotational piece for the foreseeable future. And there are some comparisons that I see sometimes to Matisse Thibel. I do want to kind of elaborate on the differences there that for Matisse specifically, obviously him and Springer have somewhat similar strengths and weaknesses, that they're both defensive-oriented guys who have their weaknesses on the offensive end. But Matisse always had this deer in headlights kind of look that he was just straight up scared at times on the offensive end. And Springer does not have that, that he's a guy that relies on his strength. He relies on athleticism. He plays like he's a football player playing basketball, but he still has that like desire, that that will, that strength, that like you can see him wanting to go at guys that I do appreciate that. And that gives me a ton of optimism for his long term future, that unlike Matisse or a guy like Ben Simmons with the offensive deficiencies that you can see like the scaredness in them. There's none of that in Springer. And for that, I think he's going to be just fine in the long haul. And he has shown linear progress that it's kind of tough on a guy like Springer when you think about his career arc that so much of his game is so reliant on that strength and athleticism. And that doesn't quite translate to the NBA level. These are the best athletes in the world. These are the, the most complete athletic guys that you can go against that you being the best athlete on the court is no longer the case. So he's had to adjust to that, and he's also had to adjust from going from being a guy who had basically unlimited touches, who could go get to his spots all his entire upbringing, even through college at Tennessee, getting a fair share of the opportunities, to now he basically has to minimize his game to being an effective catch-and-shoot guy and picking his, picking his spots. And my last point on Springer specifically is he's still 21 years old, that this is a guy who's younger than a lot of rookies in this class. And I do think the reason for moving on for the Sixers is still this cap space plan. That when you looked ahead at the Sixers' future, look towards next year, that it is Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey has a cap hit and basically a blank contract, so I'm basically going to count him in this. Then it is Paul Reed and it's Jaden Springer. That by doing this decision, by making this move, by getting him off the books, they freed up four and a half more million dollars for next year. Now, I cannot reinforce enough, and I will have another video talking about more in depth this cap space plan now that it looks like it's clearly laid out once again, but I cannot emphasize enough how stupid I think it is that it only works that, that this is only going to be effective if it all plays out that if we zoom ahead to next offseason and the Sixers are overpaying to keep Buddy healed and throwing another contract at Tobias Harris on a resign and whatever else overpaying for guys because they have the money then it's not a good look that this only works out if you have stars or have guys that you know want to come here that you have and I get like you can make this look like an appealing destination that you do have Joel Embiid, a guy who's an MVP caliber talent. You do have Tyrese Max, who's an up-and-coming star. I know it's a passionate fan base in Philadelphia. All these things that you can hype up as it a, being a nice landing spot. But look at the track record of actually bringing free agents into Philadelphia. Spoiler alert, it's not good. That the greatest player that has been come here in free agency in recent years is Al Horford, man. And that failed miserably. That Al Horford hated it here. We had to overpay to bring him and then had to attach draft picks to his contract just to trade him out there. And now he's back on the Boston Celtics and still playing at a high level, a higher level than he ever did with the Sixers. So it has not worked in years past. Maybe it's different than Daryl Morey. Who knows? But I just wholeheartedly disagree with the stance that is better to maximize cap space next year versus prioritizing this year. And with the Joel Embiid conversation, one of the things that I've said through the injury is what the Sixers do at the trade deadline will say much more about their optimism for whether or not he returns than anything that they could publicly say. Well, now we are past the trade deadline, and I'm still not sure what the hell that was. That We saw the win now move with Buddy Heald. That gave me a ton of optimism. That That's a great piece that can be effective next to Joel Embiid. I don't think we'll see the best version of Buddy Heald until he's sharing the floor with Joel. But then it's these other moves. It's trading guys away. So I, I'm very frustrated with the Sixers team on the lack of commitment to a direction. That I believe it's worse to sit in this middle ground than co to commit to either way. That if Daryl Morey had officially decided, you know what, we don't know what level Joel's coming back. We're not even 100% certain that he will be back. It's better just push our chips in next year. Let's trade off. Let's be sellers. I would have been content with that. I would have understood the logic in it. Or if you want to say we cannot priority or we cannot waste any seasons of Joel Embiid's prime because we don't know how many years he will be capable of playing at this level, we have to go all in this year. Frankly, that was more of my mindset and what I think should have been done. 
if that was the case, then you go all in and you do it. And I would have been 100% happy with that. But this middle ground, this playing to both sides, this looking towards the future but still kind of committing now or looking to compete this season, very frustrating to me. So I do want to hear from you guys. Let me know if you're as mad as I am in the comments. I will be having a couple more videos drop throughout the weekend. Want to talk a little bit more about that future plan. Talk a little bit more about some potential buyout candidates that this team could be looking to bring in. And hopefully that once that happens, once we bring in those three new roster spots, that the roster makes a little more sense than it currently does. But for now, appreciate you guys for tuning in. Make sure you're smashing that subscribe button, dropping a like on the video, and we'll be talking with you next time right here on Sixers Digest. Peace.